we might still have some people trickling in, but I know uh, most of the people that um, are SVP are here. And I just wanted to start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Kara Wood Sarah. I'm a principal resiliency planner with the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. And I am the project lead for the uh, McDill MIRR at the Regional Planning Council. And I'm also joined today by Erica Harris, who is our project lead from AECOM, which is our primary consultant for this project. Uh, so an overview of what we want to accomplish today, uh, we want to kind of re-kick off the project. Uh, so we'll give you some project background, talk about some of the past um, resilience history at McDill, the goals of the project, the role of this group, which is the technical advisory group. Um, oh, Tony says he's not hearing me. Are other people hearing me? I can hear you, Karen. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about the role of this group. Um, so some of you may be new, some of you may have joined us previously, uh, so we want to make sure everyone's kind of on the same page as we re-kick off this project. And uh, then we'll review the vulnerability assessment process and talk about some of the climate mapping and as asset inventory that we've already conducted up to this point. And then finally, we'll wrap up with next steps. Uh, I'll record this meeting and I'll try to make notes and presentations available to those who were missing the meeting. Okay. Um, so let's get started with a little bit of background. If you're not aware, um, McDill Air Force Base was already a leader in resiliency for our region. They kind of are aware at the base that there's vulnerabilities, as you can see in the top right and the bottom left. Um, the mission is uh, potentially impacted by flooding, tropical storms, hurricanes, uh, and we know that that's only potentially gonna get worse with sea level rise. So the base is already thinking about these types of things and trying to implement solutions like new stormwater infrastructure that you see in the bottom right, and um, tidal flood barriers like in the top left. And these are some more examples of uh, new projects related to resiliency that are already happening on the base even before we started this study. The base was really forward thinking on resiliency. <coughs> Excuse me, so you can see some nature-based solutions uh, in the bottom, some more pervious pavement on the left side, and more stormwater infrastructure at the top. And again, the base is really uh, focusing on nature-based solutions, uh, as you can see on this slide, with living shorelines and some of the uh, rewilding and living shoreline um, uh, projects that you can see on the right. So the base was already thinking about resiliency. This project is really just intended to take it a step forward. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so this slide shows one, our project area on the right, which is gonna be south of Gandhi for this project. And that includes uh, obviously not just the base, but some of the neighborhoods north of the base. So the project goals are to identify the climate vulnerabilities and any potential impacts. And again, that's not just to uh, what's on the base, but also the community infrastructure off the base. Uh, oh, I'm going to mute this guest. One moment, sorry. Okay, um, so then uh, another project goal is reducing risk. So we're thinking about strategies that we can use to reduce risk and ide identifying opportunities for coordination. So we know that it's not going to be just the base thinking about how to make the mission in the neighborhood more resilient. It's gonna be the city, it's gonna be the county, uh, the, there's gonna be um, private utilities involved as well. So there's a lot of coordination that will need to happen to, in order to make this South of Candy area more resilient. Uh, we're hoping the project outcomes include clear priorities for sector asset protection. And we want those priorities to be grouped in short, mid and long-term. Um, categories so that we know what can be kind of the things that we can tackle right away and then what can we start to add into our maybe capital improvement plans for the long term. 
We'll also have an implementation plan. So uh, who is responsible for um, thinking of some of those adaptation projects? And are any of those projects regional? How can we continue to incorporate regional priorities in um, these local actions? And then finally, our final project outcome is that we are aware that this um, the completion of this study will lead to uh, potential funding opportunities, including funding from Old CC, which is the funder for this project. I'm going to turn it over now to Erica to talk more about uh, where we are in our project currently. Thanks, Kara. Um, I'm going to go and go to the next slide. So Kara went over some of the great project initiatives um, that are taking place at McDill, and they're already being put into place to increase uh, climate resilience at the base. Um, she also discussed how the goals of the MER project align to kind of bolster those, those base ongoing act efforts. Um, so now I'm going to talk briefly about the overall process that we're going to use to kind of walk through this project in the stepwise fashion that we're showing here. So um, the first of the six main steps focuses on setting the context. So this is where we are trying to understand the physical and the regulatory setting of the study area. You know, we're reviewing those policies and other ongoing complementary projects that are happening and just really trying to get a lay of the land and understand um, the critical areas that we should focus on for the project. Uh, step two focuses on developing the inventory of our assets and services that are going to be considered in the study. Um, it's, you know, it's not really possible or even necessary for us to look at everything. So last year, we worked with many of you on this call to kind of help us gather that data set of locations of important infrastructure to consider. For step three, um, we're reviewing, or we, we did review actually already, the, um, the latest climate scenarios and hazards that are being considered in the project. Um, we developed maps of existing and future conditions to show how the extent of these different hazard boundaries may evolve in the future. And then we're using all of this information gathered in steps one through three to inform step four, which is the vulnerability and the risk assessment. So this is the step that we're going to be using to identify those specific assets or locations of the project area that are most at risk to climate hazards. And then once we know these locations, they're going to be the focus of steps five and six, which are the steps that probably everybody on this call is most interested in, honestly, because this is the part where we're going to be developing those strategies and those partnership recommendations, um, and, and really importantly, those funding opportunities that are going to come out of the project. And something um, that I want to reiterate here before we move on is, is that the projects that are prioritized through this MER are going to be focused on the community, so they're outside of the fence line. Um, so while there has to be a direct benefit to the missions that are being carried out at McDill, there also needs to be that community benefit as well. Um, you know, this MER is funded through the OLDCC, which stands for the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation. So it's focused on assisting communities that are adjacent to or are influenced by military installations. So um, basically projects that are prioritized in this MER may be eligible for project implementation funds through the OLDCC or other um, DOD funding streams. So um, uh, I guess I'll also point out that we talked this week with our OLDCC representative. Um, I don't know, is Bill on the line, Kara? I didn't see him join. So he, he said that uh, high priority projects that are identified through the MER can receive an implementation study grant um, to take through 60% design level to try to assist with those kind of pre-construction needs. And he gave us a couple of examples of projects that have already been funded. Um, and I remember one of them was, was focused on identifying corrosion issues and water pipes that serve both the base and the adjacent communities. So that implementation study focused on finding the extent of those, those corrosion locations um, and then looked into permitting considerations and gathering information about replacement cost estimates. Um, and now they're looking at actually obtaining those construction funds to um, actually put the, you know, put shovels in the ground and replace those sections of pipe. So um, just to give you a little bit more information about kind of where this is going and the potential for these funding streams. So last year, um, we got almost all the way through step four, which is what we're showing on the slides now. Um, but we ended up having to put the project on a brief slash not so brief hold. Uh, and the reason for this is that the MER study is one of several that are occurring in Florida. And we happen to be the first one out of the gates. So we were the first one that was awarded. Um, and for those that have been with us for a while, you remember that we selected sea level rise scenarios that aligned with the um, lower, lower Peninsula flood program to promote a level of consistency with the city of Tampa. 
However, um, the state recently got involved and, uh, in this MER process, and they recommended that all of the MERs that are occurring across the state use the resilient Florida sea level rise scenarios. So now we're going back and we're changing our mapping scenarios and updating the vulnerability assessment so that the results can align with, with state requirements. Next slide. And so you might be wondering, um, you know, what is your role in all of this? Um, well, we've identified all of you as local experts and industry leaders for your organizations that you represent. And because of all of the overlapping jurisdictions in the South Peninsula area adjacent to McDill, it's really important that we have your sector-based perspectives and insights to help us identify and understand where those problem areas are, as well as any ongoing projects or, uh, or future project needs to reduce that risk to the communities and infrastructure. Um, and this is a two-way benefit because, like I said before, any projects that are prioritized through the MER may be eligible for funding through the DOD. So this can be viewed as another potential uh, funding stream for projects that you're trying to get put into action. So I'll pause here for a second. Um, any questions about this so far? You got your role or about the overall process? Okay, we can keep going. So um, as, as a part of our early engagement in the project, um, we met with stakeholders from the base and the community in a series of interviews to talk about some of the issues that are being experienced at the project site. And I'm not gonna read through all of this, um, but I just wanna quickly skim through some of the high level findings from each one of these interviews, just to kind of refresh everybody and bring our, our new members up to speed. So from our stormwater and environment discussion, um, we know that like most of Florida, the stormwater system here is gravity drained, which means there is a lot of localized flooding that occurs during our heavy um, summer rain events. There's particular stormwater concerns that are located outside of the uh, McDill gate at, um, on the uh, east side of the installation. Um, there's also concerns for the Port Tampa City neighborhood with a lot of stormwater ponding that occurs there. Um, overlapping with our study area, the city also has a lower peninsula improvement program that they're trying to use to address a lot of the um, issues related to flooding that occurs in the lower peninsula area. So hopefully we can have a lot of projects um, that'll come out of that that'll be overlapping with our MERS study as well. Um, let's see, other issues identified, well, there's a lot of stormwater or sorry, uh, shoreline erosion that's happening on the southeast side of the base. Um, there's also a lot of concerns with invasive um, vegetation species, which are impacting training site areas to the south. Next slide. Water and wastewater at the base is privatized, so it's managed separately at the fence line. Um, water is delivered from the city of Tampa, and then once it enters that fence line, it's, it's managed by the base. And then wastewater is, is collected and treated on site, um, so it doesn't actually connect in with the city system at all. And during these conversations, we did talk about the potential of um, possibly uh, providing that connectivity to increase redundancies, but it didn't seem like um, that was something that was going to be a viable option. Uh, one of the biggest issues here is probably actually going to be the base's wastewater treatment plant due to its close proximity to the, the coastline and, and its low elevation. So that's something we'll be taking a closer look at. Go to the next slide. From a planning perspective, um, the city of Tampa is doing a lot of additional work across the city to prepare for potential climate change impacts. In addition to some of the larger uh, climate planning efforts, the city is also advocating for green infrastructure and nature-based flood protection of the shorelines, which may actually complement some of the priorities from the Army Corps of Engineers and Port Tampa Bay, which are advocating for the reuse of dredge sediments for local projects. Another big project that folks talked about was the plan to um, add a potential commuter ferry for the McDill staff um, to provide a water uh, taxi access across Hillsborough Bay uh, to access that east side near Brandon where a lot of the staff live. Next slide. For power supply, um, TECO provides energy to the base and the surrounding communities. Um, there hasn't been a lot of issues yet related to extreme weather events. However, um, there are a lot of projects that are going on to increase base energy resiliency, including new substations, um, bearing electrical lines, and operating a natural gas plant to um, have on-site energy generation. Next slide. For transportation, um, this is probably one of the biggest resilience issues that we heard about during these interviews. 
Um, due to its location on the Narrow Peninsula, there's a lot of congestion within the community, especially when those base shift changes happen. Um, there's very little public transportation options in this area, so almost everyone drives their, their own vehicle, which creates a lot of traffic in the area. So major projects in the area include um, resurfacing and elevating roadways, um, adding backflow prevention and upsizing outfalls. Uh, the group discussed that while elevating roadways really helps with flood protection, it's really costly and often um, not cost effective, and it introduces challenges with tying it in with adjacent properties. Next slide. Okay, for the last interview, this was focused on emergency management. McDill seems to have a lot of uh, really great partnerships and coordination efforts already in place with the city and the county regarding their emergency management preparedness, um, you know, with things like pre-storm logistics and training, um, post-storm cleanup. And similar to what we heard in the transportation conversations, roadway flooding was probably one of the biggest threats here for emergency management. Um, but there are also was issues with overhead power lines outside of the base that we talked about could be buried, um, especially along some of those utility push routes. Next slide. So um, the information that was collected in the interviews, it, it helps us to set the context in the setting, but it also helps us to inform the vulnerability assessment, which basically serves as a screening tool to help us understand the assets and the areas um, of the project that, that should be the focus of adaptation strategy development. So vulnerability, just really quickly, is, is primarily informed by the top two components of this diagram you're looking at. So it's exposure and sensitivity. And exposure, exposure tells us basically, do the assets come into contact with the hazards? Um, and sensitivity tells us, do they have characteristics that make them susceptible to damage? And for assets that are exposed, we're also looking at consequence, which tells us about how the community and the base could be affected if those assets were to be damaged. And we're also looking at adaptive capacity, which tells us about how easily those assets could be modified to maintain their functionality. If you go to the next slide, um, so we'll, we'll assign relative ratings ranging from low to high to each one of these different components um, and prioritize the assets that are exposed with a high sensitivity and a high consequence of failure. So this diagram we're looking at now is just a conceptual figure to kind of demonstrate that idea that we'll be focused on those assets that fall in that high sensitivity, high consequence quadrant in the upper right area. Um, any, any questions about this process? I know there are a lot of folks doing vulnerability assessments right now, so you might already be very aware of this uh, process of classifying uh, at-risk infrastructure, but just wanted to pause here for a minute. Okay, we can keep going. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Oh, is there a delay on? Oh, maybe there's a delay, yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> So um, here are the climate hazards that we'll be focused on to understand their impacts to MacDill and the adjacent communities. So we're looking at um, high frequency tidal flooding due to average high tides and king tides. Um, we're also looking at coastal storms. So looking both at those lower level storm events with a 10 year return period, as well as a more extreme 100 year um, storm event. In addition to coastal flooding, we're also looking at rainfall and extreme heat impacts. Next slide. As I mentioned before, over the past year, um, we've worked with many of our stakeholders, including folks on this call, to collect the locations of community and installation assets. Um, and I've listed the infrastructure types that we're looking at here. So um, it's, it's a lot of detailed information from everything from utilities and roadways and buildings um, to natural areas and parks. And we're in the process now of overlaying these, these new hazard layers that we've created onto these asset locations to pick out those high priority areas that we're gonna be focused on for adaptation strategies. Go to the next slide. So with this um, pause in the work, our new projected project end date is the end of February, 2024. So the symbols that you'll probably all be most interested in are those green dots that signify the approximate timing of our um, technical advisory committee meetings and workshops. So we're planning to have a series of five meetings, including the one that we're in today, and possibly three in-person workshops to help prioritize and refine the strategies and projects to include in the recommendations of the study. Next slide. 
And just to give you an idea um, of one of the outcomes of this project, um, we're envisioning developing these strategy su sum summary sheets for um, each of the recommended strategies that, that provides details about the project, including things like um, project description, um, project benefits, implementation steps, estimated costs, um, project leads and partners, and potential funding sources. And this example is from the Northern Virginia MER, which AECOM just completed last month. Um, so just a quick look ahead at some of the upcoming engagement opportunities with all of you. Um, I mentioned that there are three workshops with the first one right around the corner. I know Kara sent out a doodle poll for all of you to fill out um, to help us with the planning for a time that works best with the group. So if you could all please check your emails again, and maybe Kara can even drop this into the chat now um, just for you to fill out. It'd be really helpful for us if you could take a look at this. Um, we have some interactive exercises and we have travel logistics to plan for. And so for this all to work, we just need to make sure there's going to be a good group there to, to show up. So the first workshop is going to focus on sharing the results of the vulnerability assessment and um, key focus areas for adaptation. We'll also use that prioritized list of assets that comes out of that assessment to do an interactive exercise where we're going to all work together through um, this process of identifying shared risks that exist both inside and outside of the fence line um, if those high priority infrastructure, um, if it were to fail or if it became damaged. Later in the summer, um, we're hoping to have another workshop where we can meet again to brainstorm planned or needed strategies and projects. So we want to get all of you together again and help us identify where are there are projects that are already being planned, you know, where are there are gaps that aren't being addressed, and so that we can get all of that documented and incorporated into our recommendations. And then in the fall, um, we'll come together for our last time to refine those strategies and the details that are captured in those sheets like I just showed you in, in the previous slide. So any, any questions about that? I have a question. Yes. Uh, hi, Erica. Hi, Kara. Uh, hi, all. Eric Kaplan, Tampa International Airport. Uh, great presentation. You know, I'm a newbie to this group, so it was great to get the, the background and kind of catch up. Uh, we're doing a lot of parallel planning, at least. The Tampa International Airport ran into a similar issue with uh, kind of having old um, slosh model data that's not consistent with Resilient Florida grant program guidelines, too. So ran into a similar issue there. A um, couple of questions I have, I think on just general scope, so I'm familiar. Um, one, the, the background seemed, um, at least what's a lot's been done already, and it's actually really great to see, um, but it seems very uh, perimeter based. And I'm wondering if uh, this, the scope of this work is looking at both perimeter protection and then individual asset protection, for instance, you know, uh, we both have airfields and so very similar layouts and we've got uh, electrical vaults, you know, on the airfield that are very vulnerable that probably need more redundancy and resilience planning. And so I'm wondering if, it, if this is also an asset based approach and, um, you know, what's the, uh, the general scope for MGDIL? Are, are we, are they planning to kind of make it through maybe a storm and, and come back fully operational or planning for maybe just to, to stay resilient uh, for emergency services and purposes? Um, is there a specific scope in that sense? Well, I don't want to speak on behalf of McDill. I don't, Tony, if you want to, if you're on the line, maybe you could speak to what their overall perspective on that is. Sure. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is Tony Rodriguez at McDill, and uh, Eric. I guess to answer your question, uh, we are we we do things uh, within the perimeter as well. Basically, all of our new construction is going up, um, and all of our all of our uh, utilities on and phone switches and so forth are up out of the floodplain and even higher than out of the floodplain. Basically, DoD policy is to build. Uh, two feet above floodplain for non-critical facilities and three foot above floodplain for critical facilities. So that's kind of the, the marching orders that, that we've been going through. And uh, as as you, you see what we've done with new construction in the base, uh, not only have we brought it away from the shoreline to and, and done things to attenuate the wave energy, but we have built up because pretty much 
almost 90% of the base is within the 100 year floodplain. So uh, we have to build up to get everything out of the floodplain. Um, but uh, no, our, our, our strategy is, is comprehensive in that uh, we're, we're working within the, um, you know, inside the perimeter to, to harden things as well. Um, including, you know, getting down to the architectural level, where those phone switches go, where your HVAC systems, you know, make sure that that they are protected and, and uh, out of the flood zones. Great, yeah, thank you, Tony, and uh, excited to get out there one day. And, yeah, I know we've been we've been playing phone tag, and we're yeah. going to get you out here for a tour. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And as far as the scope for this project, we will be looking at both, um, you know, perimeter type actions like area scale protection, as well as um, asset specific protection. That's all I had. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? I think that's all the material we have. I mean, we've talked a lot about, you know, where we were, where we are, and where we're headed. Um, if there was any questions about any of the information we've shared or um, anything like that, feel free to ask away. Uh, this is Tony again. I, I just want to just talk to the group and, and thank everyone for your participation. Uh, it's so vitally important that, that we get your subject matter expertise in on this project. Um, um, community connection that that we have to um, it's so necessary that for the to operate and maintain the mission of the base so uh, we look forward to working with all of you uh, to continue to to where we define what these resilient strategies are and um, and put some put some projects and help help everybody get some project money to, to implement these things here in the South Tampa area because really what what's good for the uh, the communities, South of uh, South of Gandy Boulevard is going to be good for McDill Air Force Base. So we all want to work together and, and make make the whole area uh, resilient. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. I, and I think that your point is well made. That we really do encourage your participation. And and so again, if you can fill out that doodle poll, we'd like to have that in person workshop because I I think that's going to really help to engage the group and give you all the opportunity to talk to each other and help us to figure out what are really the priorities for that area and some of the some of your goals as organizations. And Karen, I don't think anybody from the city is on, right? I was going to ask them for an update of that um, coastal area action plan it has an overlapping I, down. Frank. I thought we had Frank was on there. Yeah, I see Frank now. Not to put you on the spot, Frank. <laughs> No worries, no worries. Yes, um, yes, we we are in the process of of working on 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 that whole on that whole approach, so to speak. Um, it is not we don't have any finalized language. Um, I believe we should be we should have an update on that in the next probably month and a half. But I'm not really I have to touch base with all the other people that are involved in the process. As soon as I get more information, I will certainly share it with the group. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Sure. Well, if no one has anything else, again, we thank everyone for joining and um, please feel free to reach out to me with any questions. I'll put my email in the chat, but I think you all have it from the invitation. So feel free to let me know if you have questions about the project. And if not, then hopefully we'll see you at the in-person workshop next month. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.